One of the defining features of a crisis is that your horizons close in. It becomes harder to see big picture or to think long term. As we creep towards the end of the second year of pandemic life, life, or at least my life, has become suffocatingly narrow. In lockdown, every day is the same, and the world outside my neighborhood feels increasingly abstract and remote. But every now and then, I'm struck by the realization of how extraordinary this moment is. The last few years have been transformative, as in the world has transformed and transformed each of us with it. And we will never return to being the people we were before. So when I look back on it, the seismic shift in my life wasn't the first lockdown in March 2020, or even the bushfires that devastated my homeland a few months earlier. Instead, I started to feel things escalate in the year 2018. Because after three decades of stasis in the climate conversation, things suddenly broke loose. In the last three years, we've transitioned into a whole new phase of the climate era. You can see the change in governments and business where the climate issue has gained traction with almost shocking speed. You can see it in the sciences where adaptation measures are now being proposed that would have seemed absurd just a few years ago. You can see it in the climate impacts, which are hitting far faster and harder than even our worst fears of a decade ago. And you can see it in the realm of climate activism, which has gathered a stunning momentum since 2018. Andreas Malm writes about the three cycles of climate activism in the 21st century. The first took place between 2006 and 2009, with a wave of mass actions and climate camps in Northern Europe. The second commenced in 2011 in the United States with a sustained campaign of civil disobedience focused on the Keystone XL pipeline. And this phase crashed to a halt when Trump took power and announced that the pipeline would be constructed at maximum speed. The third phase, by far the largest, emerged in 2018 with the sudden rise of Greta Thunberg and the school strikes for the climate. These Fridays for Future quickly built to become the largest coordinated youth protest in history, with 1.5 million strikers in March 2019. In the United States, the Sunrise Movement gathered momentum, and in the UK, Extinction Rebellion shut down much of London over the summer of 2019. Now, Extinction Rebellion have pushed a vigorous model of non-violent civil disobedience, shutting down streets, taking over politicians' offices, and staging disruptive protests. More recently, they've begun advocating for a money rebellion, a mass movement to take out bank loans and give that money to those resisting and repairing the harm caused by the bank with no intention of repaying that debt. Others have gone further still. XR draw the line at property destruction, but other activists are advocating for the direct destruction of fossil fuel infrastructure. On the night that Donald Trump was elected president, US activists Jessica Reznicek and Ruby Montoya broke into a construction site for an oil pipeline in Iowa and burned out six pieces of heavy machinery using coffee canisters filled with motor oil. In June 2021, Reznicek was sentenced to eight years in prison. Now, these kinds of direct action will always be too small to make a meaningful dent in the machinery of fossil fuel production, but their goal is to send a message. When South African ANC guerrillas bombed a coal refinery belonging to the apartheid government in 1980, the smoke was visible from Johannesburg for three days. As Fren Egenwala wrote, it was not about the quantity of oil that was lost. It was the column of smoke that was important. It shattered the myth of white invulnerability. At a more local level, John Lanchester wonders why we don't consider it our civic duty to run our keys along the paintwork of every unnecessary SUV we see in the city, costing the owner several thousand pounds a time. Say, 50 people vandalizing four cars each, every night for a month, 
6,000 trashed SUVs in a month, and the Chelsea tractors would soon be disappearing from our streets. This year, I learned from several people in the financial sector that there are individuals working within banks who actively collaborate with climate NGOs. When the bank is on the threshold of making a big decision about its climate policy, these individuals will alert their activist allies. The climate NGO then stages a public campaign against the bank, providing some external pressure which hopefully helps to nudge the bank into making a more serious commitment. Now, one interesting hypothetical space for climate activism lies in digital disruption. The last decade has seen a huge rise in the number of ransomware attackers, hackers breaking into private computer networks and locking out the owners unless they pay a ransom. In recent years, the targets for these attacks have included school district websites, government websites, and hospitals. In May 2021, an attack by the ransomware group Darkside shut down the Colonial Pipeline Company, the largest operator of the United States' largest gasoline pipeline. Three weeks later, the largest beef producer in the world was hit. JBS SA was forced to close down many of its slaughterhouses around the world, paralyzing the operation of the beef industry. Dark rumors circulated on meat industry forums about those behind the attacks. Uh, it seems there's invested interests that will go to any lengths to disrupt farming and the red meat, uh, probably any meat, supply chain, to force prices higher and encourage the purchase of cheaper, plant-based substitutes. Be aware, and do whatever necessary to protect the brand names like meat, sausage, milk, etc., for they're coming for them all. Now this time around, the culprits were almost certainly Russian cyber criminals rather than digital eco-activists. In the future, though, why not? And ransomware attacks on destructive industries are one of a suite of more speculative projects being dreamed up as the future of climate activism. Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future posits a kind of black wing to the UN's climate efforts, which carries out extrajudicial actions to disrupt the activities of fossil fuel companies and propagandists. These include drone strikes on targeted jets, bio-warfare, like seeding foot and mouth disease in order to stop meat consumption, and even targeted assassinations. As a character in the book argues... If you were really from the future, so that you knew for sure that there were people walking the earth today fighting change, so that they were killing your children and all their children, you'd defend your people. In defense of your home, your life, your people, you would kill an intruder. Because the truth is, our current efforts are not enough. Even with the best attempts of campaigners inside and outside of government, the system won't transition quickly enough to avoid disaster. For that, we need everything. Civil disobedience campaigns, sweeping regulation, financial divestment, new technology, massive behavioural shifts, better laws, and illegal activity too. As Genevieve Gunter says, climate change isn't something we're doing it's something we're being prevented from undoing. And who's preventing us? Who are the people who are blocking the transition to a sustainable system? Who enforce what Alex Steffen calls predatory delay? Well, they are an interlocking network of politicians, bureaucrats, think tanks, lawyers, trade organizations, banks, militaries, private shareholders, hedge funds, oil companies, journalists, and pundits. There are probably more than a million, but fewer than 10 million people worldwide who actively benefit from and abet the destruction of the biosphere. And there can be no reasoning with them. As Sarah Miller says, what more about climate change does anyone need to know? What else is there to say? All the right words about climate have already been deployed. It's time for different weapons. The people who are fighting for the preservation of outdated, harmful systems in 2021 are not going to be persuaded by protest placards or scientific reports. The only option is to make the cost of their choice high enough 
that they're no longer willing to pay it. And one thing that the pandemic has revealed is that we are willing to do far more extreme things than we realized. Last year, each of us radically reshaped our lives in the space of a few short weeks. In the United Kingdom, politicians held off on announcing a lockdown because they assumed that people wouldn't be willing to make that sacrifice. But it turns out that we are willing. We're willing to go to extraordinary lengths to protect our community and each other. Now, if you're willing to suspend your life for months or years at a time, to refrain from seeing friends and family, to put your life plans on indefinite pause in order to give our healthcare system the best chance of surviving this crisis, what else might you be willing to do? I'm not an activist in any way, and I've never considered myself to be, to be someone who would risk my own comfort in order to save the world. But I have. All of us have. And now we know how far we're willing to go, and it's further than many of us imagined. So now, as the impacts of planetary change are hitting faster and faster, and those 10 million people dig their heels in to slow down any meaningful change, I'm starting to ask myself, what else is possible?